Uh, my name's Silva Ross. I'm vice principal here at the college. And I'm absolutely de delighted uh, that Bob has agreed to uh, run this webinar as part of our, our centenary program. And Bob, if it's okay, as we're at time, may I hand over to you? Okay, thank you. Um, this is going to be a conversation. Um, I'm not lecturing. This is a, this is a seminar, webinar. Um, so I just introduce who I am. Um, and it's uh, ni nice that there's people here who I don't actually know. Is there any chance of um, cameras? All oh, right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll go around and introduce ourselves. Um, I think I, I, I know normally people keep their microphones muted, um, but just you know, switch them back on. I think everybody seems to know how to do this because you've all you've all muted your microphones. So you know how to turn it back on again. Um, top right hand corner, of course, of the uh, of your image. Um, so that uh, I don't really have speakers lists or anything like this. Let's try and do this more as a conversation than than uh, you know. If things get a bit messy, and I'll I'll just intervene and so that people can can speak. But also, um, if uh, we just get used to giving way when someone else wants to speak as well, um, obviously that's not interrupting and talking over, but you know, it's giving way and then we can try and make this as natural a conversation as possible. Okay, who am I? Well, I um, worked for Suma Whole Foods, Big Workers Co-op for 30 years. And during that time, desperately tried to find out what this thing called leadership is in worker cooperatives and watched so-called leadership in uh, other cooperatives in retail societies. Hello to Phil. Hi, Phil. Um, so I'm going to go around now. Uh, we'll just do a, a quick round. Um, it's five past four, and there's how, how many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we just sort of about 30 seconds each, uh, and uh, then we'll get around and then we can get on with it. So um, do you want to say any more, Scylla? No, that's that, that's fine. I'm, I think most people on the call are a number know me, so I'm delighted to. Um, I, 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 Bob, you've introduced yourself. I've got the list of people. Phil, would you like to say something about yourself, quickly? Oh, sorry, is that me? It is. Yes. Well, we can only see the top of your head, Phil. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, launch the application. Excellent, that's good. Read and proceed. Um, so, so what, what would you like to know? My apologies, I've literally just just come online. Okay, that's fine. You're here. That's great. Um, just thirty seconds. What's your interest in leadership in cooperatives? Well, after uh, uh, trying to run a cooperative of um, physicists, I was rather like herding cats. <laughs> It's, um, it's a case of trying to find a better means to uh, um, a better understanding of how this process can work. And it can't be driven. It's got to be somehow a shared experience. And um, I'm, I've looked at lot, I've looked at some of the complexities to talking about. Bob. I've looked at systems thinking, and um, um, it's it's quite a, it's quite a minefield. I think it's going to be a lifelong student by the way, or you haven't. But thank you for uh, asking me. Okay, great, great. Okay, Hannah, do you want to go next? Okay, Hannah. Hannah says she doesn't have functioning microphones. So, Hannah, uh, on chat, um, if you want to. Uh, if you want to go and see chat, it's at the bottom. Uh, is it in more? Yes, it's in more. Bottom, so if you could yeah. go to the bottom of the screen, uh, mute is on the left, and then there's more almost to the right. And if you click on that, you can see chat. Uh, click on that, and then you'll get what people are typing in as well. So 
So I'm afraid Hannah uh, will be only listening. So Dermot, how about you? Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks for uh, the uh, talk today. Uh, my name is Dermot. I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University. Um, so I teach and I research on leadership. Uh, and I've done some research on uh, group dynamics in a co-housing group. So they're not technically a cooperative, but they do use consensus mm -hmm. decision making. Which, and I can see the kind of the parallels. I'm, I'm hoping to learn a bit more about some of the, the thoughts and ideas around that. Okay, great. And um, so your name isn't up Centre for Human Ecology. So <laughs> what's your name? Apologies, that's my fault. I was logged on um, with the organisation Zoom earlier and I forgot to switch it to my own account. I'm <laughs> Anne Winter and um, I'm uh, working for the Centre for Human Ecology. We're, uh, we've recently become a cooperative and uh, the centre itself um, has been somewhat mothballed in terms of its curriculum, um, its teaching curriculum for several years and we're rebuilding a new curriculum um, starting hopefully later this year. And I've also, I know Scylla well because I've been working for quite some time on the Cooperative University project with her as well. Okay, Th thanks Sam. that's great. Um, and then got Kiri. Would you like to? Um, yeah, hi, I'm Kiri. Um, we're working at Nottingham Trent University doing some research uh, into worker co-ops. So uh, generally interested in any, any kind of the challenges that co-operatives face. Um, I guess particularly on my mind at the moment is um, when kind of leadership becomes hierarchy and when that um, uh, is the process of challenging that what's necessary or is there something other specific issues around leadership that need to be kind of taken into account so like what what's that blurred boundary between leadership being acceptable cooperative leadership and leadership becoming some kind of an informal hierarchy so so that I guess that question is particularly on my mind today but not my interest isn't limited to that by any means okay great right and uh, we've got Sharon can you can you speak, Sharon? No, it's just got it's just. I, I, a, I think Sharon's having some problems, Bob. Um, yeah, sure. Well, let's hope she sorts it out. Um, I think she can hear us, but I don't think if you use you use the chat function just to tell us if you're there, Sharon, and then uh, you can ask questions in chat in chat. Um. All oh, right. Yeah, she's uh, Sharon's posted something on uh, the chat. Uh, so we are the first housing mutual with a representative body made up of employee and customer members. Our interest in leadership is balancing mutuality and business leadership. So that's a common issue. Not having the luxury of all the time in the world before you take a business decision. Yeah. Is that, uh, would that be Rochdale, Sharon? I'm not sure if you can hear us. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes, she says yes. That's great. Okay, and now we have Phil, Phil Coulthard. Phil, would you like to introduce yourself and say what your interest in, in uh, leadership in cooperatives is, please? I think you started with me, Bob. We've had Phil. Oh, yes, you're Phil. I've got two. Sorry, Phil. I didn't, <laughs> I've never actually seen you. <laughs> we've we've communicated masses by <laughs> by uh, Lumio and things, but I've got two I've got two um, two things for Phil Phil Coulthard. I've got Phil C and Phil Coulthard on my screen. So oh, nice. anyway, yeah. just ignore the other one. That's good. Okay, so there's some issues already been brought up here. Uh, Kerry was saying, when does leadership merge into hierarchy? Um, which some people think is bad and some people think is good. And um, hierarchy is one of those confusing words that means different things to different people. So that might be something we talk about. Um, and there are, obviously there are different, well, as I say, there are different types of hierarchy. Um, Phil was mentioned about trying to... Uh, 
organize a cooperative of strong-willed individuals is you described it as herding cats uh, and that that is certainly my experience in a in a worker co-op where everybody is of equal status and you've got seconds to grab someone's attention before they have to go off and do do some work and it it and the bigger the worker co-op gets, the more difficult it is to get someone's attention. Um, so uh, what other examples did we have? Uh, and then we had uh, Sharon. Um, yeah, Sharon, uh, as, as she said, balancing mutuality and business leadership. So how do you, I presume this is what, what you mean because I, I understand this one as well um, how do you get some sense of direction in an organization um, when you have to take business decisions uh, that have a time have a time limited and maybe not to the liking of a significant proportion of your membership as well um, and uh, what yeah, we're, we're transitioning to a cooperative, so we've got the issues of having more of a hierarchical structure mm -hmm. and moving to something which is led by the members. Right, right. So, you, you, so you're currently uh, a formal uh, executive hierarchy? Um, we're a, a charity with a board of directors. Right. Um, which has essentially set the or directed it um, and set the the direction of the of the which is the educational charity uh -huh. moved to a cooperative so it's a very different approach and it's trying to bring and for us as a team of seven of us it's changing from seven. that mm. leadership role to a inclusive of the members role which is difficult and not only just bringing them with us but actually getting them interested in the first place to help move it forward themselves as well the empowerment of them as well right so yeah we can you, you i mean you talk more about that because that's very important you know so that's a small worker cooperative coming out of a quite a hierarchical organization and those people may have quite limited agency uh, and a personal um discretion or they may have been just left to to their own devices by the trustees who don't concern themselves with daily work. I mean, I've, I've come across both extremes in organizations. So let's talk about some of the things that people um, usually think of when they say leadership. Uh, the What's often described as the dominant idea is the leader's control. Um, so we have the corporate structure with a pyramid with the chief executive and at the top, possibly with a chairman or chair, and they have ultimate power in the organization and it flows down from there. I mean, we, we do have that in co-ops, of course, uh, the big retail consumer societies are based on that model and, and some of them are, I would say, are probably more authoritarian than uh, PLCs, than uh, investor owned businesses. And uh, some of them work very well, but some of, them, some of them have been a disaster. In fact, probably most of them have been a disaster over the years. In the 19th century, there were something like 1500 consumer retail societies and most of them failed and were um, absorbed by the neighboring society so that the, these retail consumer societies who run the co-op shops, uh, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, people were complaining about the managers taking over in the 1850s. Well, you know, by the 1890s, it was pretty clear that the managers were more or less in control. And that process continued through the 20th century until we got to 
the cooperative group in 2013. So the cooperative group got to be the biggest by swallowing everybody else. Um, no consumer retail society. So these are cooperatives that are owned by their customers. And they have a form of representative democracy. They, they elect representatives who then serve as directors on the board and they then employ managers to run the businesses, which in some cases are massive, billions of pounds of turnover. But in 2013, it was very clear that uh, the business was out of control, that the, men, the members had virtually no influence over the chief executive and his executive managers. And uh, he took some very questionable decisions and, um, and the business very nearly collapsed. They lost the cooperative bank and the rest of the business very nearly collapsed. And when I talked to elected directors who were on the board and said, well, why didn't you stand up to him? Uh, and the person I talked to said, well, because he was very clever at, at practicing divide and rule. And he also was a, a, an aggressive man who scared individuals and, and threatened them. So he controlled them. So that, that was a form of leadership. It went horribly wrong. There are retail societies which have different chief executives and different chairs, which seem to work well enough. So I think we're probably more interested in other forms of leadership than the executive hierarchy. And so can we just put that one to bed then? Yeah, I think so. I think we'll put that one to bed. So let's talk about things that are more fluid. Um, any examples of where leadership has uh, turned into hierarchy, informal or formally, that you, in your experience? So, you see, oh, I'm not sure if the audio is live or not. Is there a problem? Excuse me, can you hear me, Bob? Yes, I can hear you, Phil. All right, okay, I'm, I wasn't sure, sorry. Um, I've got the green light on my PC, so I, um, um, I was aware the video was recording, but I wasn't sure about the sound. Um, Silla, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear everybody. I just unmuted. So okay, that's fine. Good. I did actually say, Bob, I'm getting quite a lot of interference from your mic, which I sent you a chat note about, but I'm not oh, sure. Right. Sorry, I didn't read that. So I have to, I'll, I'll turn the speaker down. If I can can... see everybody. You can see everybody, Silla. I, I... I can only see Bob. Oh, I see the things. It's as if the sound, the, the speech, actually gives you the mic. Is that how it works? It gives you yes. the video. Wow. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Well, that's clever. Yeah. yeah. Keep so if you, if you want to speak, just hold your hand up, or, or there is a hold your hand up function somewhere or other, but it's a bit awkward. Yeah, Phil. So I was just going to ask. I was reading the Plunkett... Um, uh, governance, the Simply Governance document, was very good. And I'd never thought of a, an audit of governance. So I'm wondering why the uh, cooperative uh, governance audit, which should have been carried out, didn't pick up this dominant um, um, and rather poor, poor leadership from this one man. Um. Yes, that's a very good question. And it, it, it also raises the issue of whether these formal methods, somebody's, something's happened, I don't quite know what happened there. Uh, <laughs> I think somebody disappeared. Um, Sharon's gone, yeah. Okay, well, let's just carry on. Um, 
whether these formal methods, so for example, governance audits, whether they can pick up on this kind of behavior or whether when you have somebody who's very clever and very competent, that they can find a way around them so that it doesn't, as it were, shine the spotlight on them. I mean, in informal, uh, in the formal way of speaking about it, the, there is um, the agent principle problem in these big cooperatives with representative management. So the, the principles are the owners, the members, and their agents, the managers, take over and run the organization in their interest. I mean, it's a, it's a major problem in the private sector as well. Everybody talks about the agent principle problem. And it seems that uh, big cooperatives are particularly vulnerable to that happening. Thank you. Okay. Um, does, has anybody heard of the, uh, the uh, tyranny of structurelessness? Yeah. Um, it was a, an essay. Yeah, Sharon says, afraid we need to go. Um, it was an essay in the 1970s, at the beginning, the very beginning of the women's liberation movement. Um, women's liberation activists uh, decided that all forms of hierarchy were bad and tried to run their groups without any formal structure as a way of avoiding hierarchy. And... Um, to their horror, what happened was that dominant individuals took over and they ended up with an informal hierarchy, which couldn't be challenged because there were no formal rules. And some people said, well, that's actually worse than having a formal hierarchy where you have rules and you can get rid of people by voting them off the board. So you're quite right, this idea of informal hierarchies developing is, uh, is a major problem, especially in cooperatives where everybody has equal status. Did, was that your experience, Phil? Well, it was, but uh, well, I've, experienced it, I've experienced it as well in charitable groups. So. Um, wasn't necessarily down to um, the kind of work or, or the pay. Um, was, um, I think it is a bit like your tyranny of structurelessness. If you don't have something in place, people tend to make come in with preconceived ideas of how a business should be run. And by the way, we don't want to be run as if we're still at work, um, especially with uh, voluntary groups. So, yeah. Um, um, I think I've got enough to say. I'm happy with the sort of the sociocracy principles in terms of how to do things. I think that works quite well. But in the practical sense of, of going out there and uh, uh, going down the rounds and, and getting people to work together, um, the actual act of getting people to, to do things works well with sociocracy. That's my, my, my feeling so far with experience. Experience of using it in a limited way. Um, yeah. Um, but for me still, in terms of, well, just what are we doing? I still tend to go back to old Stafford Beer and his, um, his variety uh, models, which I'm, I know you've got thought, you, you, you're, not, you're not happy with. But I've also been reading Mr. Jake's book about, um, I think he was a professor at the OU on uh, complexity theories. And uh, uh, that's been quite, quite useful to, to get an overview in terms of, what um, uh, complexity is about in soft system modeling. So I've, I've sort of come on a bit since um, perhaps we first discussed this. Does that help? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and there've been there have been many attempts at getting some sort of structure into these collectives, uh, and Stafford Beers. Bible systems model is a, is a popular attempt at trying to do that. Um, now, as you know, Phil, I think it's too simplistic 
I think that people are so complicated, so comp rather so complex that some of these structured models don't don't um, don't grab the complexity of people. And one of the reasons why I'm very interested in this issue of leadership and organization in cooperatives is that I have seen how the amazing performance that is possible when you have uh, fully engaged workers. Uh, the, and maybe one of the reasons why we have a productivity problem in the UK is because so many of our workers are disengaged by authoritarian management. Um, SUMA, uh, it was always a, a search at SUMA. How do we get to that point where everybody is really engaged and really working together for the common good? And it, it happened a couple of times in, in positions of crisis, um, a massive flood in 1989 when everybody just came on board to clear the wreckage up and get the business going again. And then again, in, a, in an entire IT systems failure in the 2000s, uh, when everything had to change within an hour, the whole way the business was run, because the whole IT system had collapsed, it, uh, two servers failed. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen. Your backup doesn't go off like that, but it did that time. And it was noticeable how well people work together. And it was also noticeable how you hardly needed to lead people. It, people just seemed to know what they needed to do. And so my search has always been to try and find those circumstances and try and recreate that, you know, when people say everybody's in the zone and everything is working. And I, you know, is it possible to get somewhere near that? I think it is at SUMA because SUMA's productivity and um, wealth creation uh, is noticeably higher than equivalent businesses. So there's something going on like that much of the time. And you know, SUMA is a, it's got, it's got, it, the, one of the mottos at SUMA is um, management is a function, not a status. So you recognize that organization is necessary, but with that doesn't come the ability to order people around. And so in a, in a collective like that, and, uh, and this is possibly something that, you're going to be facing with your members being of probably, I presume, of equal status. Um, how do you get a group to work together in a situation like that? When I think, as, as Phil alluded to, the natural inclination is to do your own thing, just to get on with it. And of course, when people work together in a group like that, it's not a team it's just a work group they're all just doing their own thing whereas what we are interested in is getting a team where people pre-plan and then work together and then reflect on what they've done and then do that automatically so that there's a constant sense of improvement without somebody saying uh this is the plan you're going to be working to uh, and I have the authority to make you do it. So there's a puzzle. Dermot, are you still there? Yeah, could, 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 I, could I make an observation, Bob? Of course, Silla. It, it's getting, I mean, I think that's a very useful slogan about um, management rather than, but it's not being about status and it's a bit like when Bakunin was writing in the 19th century, you know, it's recognizing that some people, you know, people have a best, some people are better at some things than other people are, but you know, it's whether you have, how that reflects in the power between you, that, that that's the key thing, you know, the, the thing that matters and that can create the, the problems. But 
the sort of recognition that you have, you know, whether it be equal work of equal value or whatever it is, you know, you have, uh, you have different skill sets for things. But, but, but one of the things I find really problematic about sort of managing or leading a co-op really is, is how you try and do all the things that need to be done to operate within a, what's, you know, is it remains and hopefully not for that much longer, but a sort of a, a capitalist uh, model, you know. So you've got so much to do in, in all this. And the fundamental thing surely is, you know, if you don't get the, I mean, I'm bound to say this, but, you know, if you don't get the education right, how on earth are you ever going to win that one? You know, how, because it's about culture, isn't it? It's about, um, it's about, rec it's, a, it's about living value, the, the values, you know, and, you know, the, trying to, I mean, Sumo was a great success uh, in a particular sector, but with, you know, fra you know, with having to operate within a, you know, a, a capitalist marketplace. So there must have been lots of difficult decisions as well as great collaborative ones. Um, some difficult ones around, you know, like we're having possibly we'll have to make, we'll have to make the cooperative university, you know, and quite ethic, difficult ethical decisions and so on. So how do you get all that balancing right? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a huge job, isn't it? Yes, and something we have to uh, recognise is that the very way we think of organisations has probably been designed by um, the people who are dominant in our society. So it may well be that the models we're trying to use predispose towards uh, hierarchies in which elites are in control. Phil? Just want to say, I, I missed the last lady's name. Um, oh. The one. My name's Scylla Phil. Scylla? Scylla, yeah. Lovely, nice to see you, Scylla. Uh. Uh, the, the boards actually behind you, I think, are, are absolutely right. You know, with complexity, it's very difficult to, uh, to to get people to do things. And but I think if people agree on the principles and the ethics, then um, a lot of complexity um, can can be can just go because everyone's. You've got to get that agreement that this is what we're going to work to. Then how they actually do things, well, really let them do it because you need the best variety to meet customers and all the rest of it get the education, as Scylla said, get the principles, get the ethics working right, and then I think you could perhaps let people go a bit more. Is it? Um, agreeing on those principles, um, that's quite a challenge, but in my experience, and I've done this with a few worker co-ops, it's about the people you want to work with and how you want to work with them, rather than you know, we're, we're going to be the best pottery worker cooperative in the world, but we're not going to talk about how we're going to work together. So we'll have superstars and then we'll have people falling out in lumps. And so our organisation won't operate very well. Um, and what happened at Zoom? Oh, first of all, uh, I always make a distinction between management and leadership. Management is keeping things going and leadership is provoking change so i think you know so people often think oh um of a, a leader when actual fact they're a very good manager and i in my experience and this quite often said um it's rare to get excellent management and excellent leadership in the same person because they're different characters. And it was interesting. I was talking to a friend who was a teacher the other day and I, and I realized, and I said, well, that sounds like you've got to be a top performing manager and a top performing leader all in the same person. There's no wonder this job is so damn difficult. This is a secondary school teacher. And yes, maybe it's an impossible ask. So what, so at SUMA, what people did was they agreed what were the behaviours of, of somebody that they would like to work with? What, what would they like to see in a colleague in terms of behaviours? And 
that had an amazing change on the organization going out and looking for those people you know uh, who fulfill this member's job description as it was called and getting a cohort of people who really wanted to work like that transformed the place in two years you know this was at a time when there were about 50 people working for the organization so that was a different way of doing it it was about looking at the people now we're fortunate in that case that we were actually able to go and find the right people and then some of the people who were the wrong people decided that this was this place was no longer for them and started to leave and so by continuing to recruit the right people uh you know the co-op was eventually flooded with people who wanted to work cooperatively but it took a long time to do that now we had that luxury now many co-ops you have to work with what you've got you can't do that and i think Anne, is that something you're well we're we're almost entirely volunteer based mm. and partly because we haven't had finances we haven't had any finances or very little money coming in for the last eight years mm -hmm. that's been forced upon us um, and we're at the point where now we are we are gaining we've, we've got a grant so we can start doing things so we're in this transition not just a cooperative transition but we're also in a we're also changing that we can actually take on staff members as well um, and we have approximately um, I can't remember the exact figures off my the top of my head I think we have in the region about 40 members of which of those I would say 15 are fairly active and um, it's really engaging with them now in as you said I, I like how you really some I like how you sum that up in terms of um, management is the keeping things going and effectively that's what the directors have been doing yeah for the last eight years and, and actually securing some funds so actually we can move forward and do something now um, and it's now we, we're looking to the members to actually provoke the changes right yes so so are your trustees willing to give up on that because sometimes i find that trustees being volunteers um they want to just drop in and out you know they want to come in say have their say and then disappear and expect things to turn out as they want when they're no longer around and then they come back again and and they also argue with each other as well so well, it's very it's difficult to get a clear idea of what you need to do to please them yeah at the moment the trustees are the people who've been doing the bulk of the work keeping things going right. uh, and it, i think it's it's there is there aren't tensions at the moment but i sense there could be in the future unless we're we carefully manage this transition Right. So maybe one of the things you could Oh Bob. Computer crash. Bob, can you hear us? Oh no. <laughs> I uh, thought it was me. <laughs> you stunned him into silence. Um no, Bob, Bob's gone. You've crashed. Okay. So he's, um... I can see yourself. What should we do, folks? How do we do this? Should I just, um... I can't sort of reboot or I'll lose everybody, won't I? So maybe Bob will rejoin. He should come back, I would have thought. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's no, I'm really sorry. Um, I know this meeting probably goes on till five, but I've got to go pick up my wife from work. So, uh, no, well, I said we needed to finish just before five, actually, but I'm just... Yeah, I'm really sorry. It's just, uh, 
Don't worry, Phil, no problem. Actually, Bob's also answered, because I, you know, he talked about um, what the characteristics were about getting the right people, and I asked what they were. And he said there were people who were prepared to take part in the collective management of the business, self-development, and to take responsibility. So, I'm, well, this is awkward because I didn't, <laughs> didn't know what to do. Any ideas? Self-organize. <laughs> Carry on the discussion? Yeah. That collective knowledge? Yeah. Carrie, you've been, you've been quiet. Do, those who, I know you may have to go, Phil, but those who haven't, made a contribution yet. Kerry and Dermot, if you're still there. Oh, Bob's back. Oh, there he oh, is. Bob's back. Oh, we were just doing Hello. something well, Bob. Um, I haven't got a screen yet. Let's have a look. Oh, oh there we are. Yeah, good. It's all right, we were just... Hello, can you hear me, Bob? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Phil's got to leave us quite soon. Um, okay. okay, so... Okay. We'll have to talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, where was I up to? Yes, about, about asking people how um, they would want their colleagues to behave in, in terms of helping to, well, in being members of the cooperative, N not in their technical jobs, um, and um, I have posted online some of this SUMA job description, but it's nice if people talk about it themselves and agree it themselves rather than just copying somebody else's. But then that act of talking and agreeing between yourselves means that you, your ideas are more aligned with each other by, by that process. And I, I have seen co-ops do that and it works you know talk amongst themselves how do you want your colleague members and by implication you to behave and it makes quite a difference it's such a simple process and i've seen others that just get the sumo on copy it and send it all around and say that's what we're doing and it doesn't work in that case it, it's not the words on the paper it's the agreement that that works but, but so, it's, it yeah. starts from quite a high level of self-awareness, though, isn't it? I and mean, I, I don't mean to sound negative, but no. uh, it's already, you know, starting from a place where you're thinking, right, that's what we need. That's, you know, and, and also recognising your own frailties, possibly, or, you know, it's, it's, it's quite challenging as a process, really. Well, that's why it's how do you want your colleague to behave? Kerry? Oh, right. Yeah, I, th I think so. I've just kind of been quietly trying to process some of the some of the stuff that's been discussed, and we've talked about kind of the need for education, and then that led on to Bob talking about this idea of getting the right people on board, and then finding a uh, sort of I guess a shared, a shared agreement over how people are going to act together. And I think a lot of a lot of that I agree with, but there's tensions among a lot of that. So mm. you know, if we for example, um, I worked quite a lot with an organization that had one remaining founder member who then brought into that organization a number of other people. Those people got on board, not because it was a co-op and they wanted to be involved in the co-op, but because they were excited about what the co-op was doing. Um, and they wanted to participate in, in bringing about those actions. And as the co-op evolved, they developed an awareness of what a cooperative was and a desire to get involved, but still that process of that they, they importantly, I think they started dem demanding that they wanted to take some responsibility and they wanted to take some control and that required some education, but that education had to be developed through a process of self-awareness. I think if the founder member had tried to educate them, or in Bob's case, if you have a member that then says, this is the job description, this is what we're going to be doing, then that is an act of management in a hierarchical sense, because you are imposing something on somebody. So there's this kind of interesting tension of, of not wanting to say, well, if you, you're, not, you're either a born cooperator or you're not, and if you're not, then get out, which isn't what we want. 
and the desire to educate but needing to balance that with this what Scylla was saying about developing that self-awareness which is very challenging and developing in yourself a desire to demand responsibility and involvement in the organization balanced with kind of where does the education come from and, and how does that situate the educator in a position of leadership I don't know if that, any of that makes sense but that's some of my reflections no it, it does yeah I mean it's a very important perspective I, I have my perspective because of my experience um, so yeah Phil, uh, you're going to have to go. Um, you I said here on the chat that right. I think if I at least type a question in, or then perhaps other people can give it some thought. I was just going to say that um, the the idea of variety um, is such such insightful things, and that Heart of Enterprise book by Stafford Beer. It's almost as if they wanted to leave this wonderful piece of work for. for for mankind and, and mm. he put so much into that book it was full of insights full of moments where i thought my god and uh, um you know variety was one one great big uh, thing the, the idea of fractals and so much in terms of um, uh, complexity thinking was already in that book um i, I just wish that um um I wish I had time, Bob, to discuss it with you. Unfortunately, I've got to dash to do the to do the uh, the honourable thing of picking up my wife from work. I really apologise to everybody for not giving you this more time. Well, Bye. thanks for being here, Phil. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Phil. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um... We, we've got about less than ten minutes left, Bob. Yeah. So I don't know whether how you want to use the last ten minutes. Can I throw a brick in the pond? <laughs> okay. You know, I said earlier about maybe the model of organization that we're trying to use in co-ops wasn't designed for us. It was designed for hierarchical, hierarchical organizations in the formal sense. Well, there is another way of thinking about organizations that they're just networks of communication. Uh, just networks of conversation between the, the people who are involved in them and that that is what's really going on and I have found that model very useful um, I've used it with with co-ops um, and the idea is to improve the quality of conversational communication in the co-ops um, and then people can agree and disagree with each other more openly and find areas of agreement and there's conflict and then there's agreement. But when people communicate in that way, it, it, yeah, things work better. Um, but that model does question whether it is actually possible to have a thing called leadership because leadership ten, does tend to suggest that something or somebody or some group is in control of the system. And my experience is that there, even in like the cooperative group, very tightly controlled executive hierarchies, nobody's really in control of them. And that maybe that structure is more about keeping powerful people in power than it is about organizing the business. So maybe we need to look at a completely different way of looking at organizations if we want to have a different kind of organization. Kerry. I, I agree with that. And I also think that more perhaps more strongly than leadership it means that we need to move away from the word of ma from the word management management isn't a politically free word it is a function of capitalism it has been created managers are act as agents of owners and as acting as for the and as an agent of an of the owner of the business they are inherently irresponsible um 
so I would argue that we need to move away from the term management and perhaps take the idea that you've got in SUMA of uh, management being a function and not a position that leadership could be the same thing in that um that leadership um chris chris land's written a really interesting paper on this drawing at, on the experience of social movements mm -hmm. and looking at how leadership was adopted when a person has the knowledge or the experience to lead on whatever it is that requires leading and then they relinquish that role once that has been achieved and completed. And then somebody else will come up. So it's more like, I always think of it as like a kind of um, a flourishing of flowers where some will open up while others close and vice versa. But I think, and I think that feeds quite nicely into that idea of the organization as a network and a conversation rather than a, a structure. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it, Yes, and somewhat seriously, when people say to me, what is leadership in a worker cooperative? I say, it's the person who says, hey guys, we've got a problem. <laughs> and doesn't just go quiet then. He keeps on saying, we've got a problem. What are we going to do about it until people start acknowledging it and doing something? And that kind of fits into the ideas of distributed leadership. Um, which, and that's interesting, isn't it? That we're having all these new theories of leadership, which are all about not having leaders. There's something changing, isn't there? There's something changing in the way that people look at organization and human relating. I think, I think social media, uh, it just makes such a mess of organizations. There's no strict boundaries anymore that the idea that somebody can be in control is evaporating okay it, it, it does and of course good good um right on capitalist companies are now very flat and uh, inclusive and all the rest of it and you'd rather work from one of those than one that's like that but it doesn't alter power relations it doesn't own it in my view doesn't alter massive inequalities poverty you know all that sort of stuff uh, or indeed when it comes down to it, control, you know, but, but, it, but it, you're right, Bob, it's a very interesting time we're living through. Um, and in fact, you know, someone who, who probably many of us know on this call, you know, I first got to know her because she wanted to, to borrow a lot of cooperative ideas to improve capitalism. <laughs> you know, it is quite interesting. You know, I mean, that, she was absolutely blatant about it, and it was fine, but she saw that some of there was some good stuff in the court and social enterprise model. How, how could she improve capitalism by adopting some of those ideas and so on? It's, so it's, it's, it's out there, isn't it? Yeah, so what is the difference then between a cooperative capitalist organisation and a true cooperative? Others might be uh, answer better than me. A cooperative, um, a cooperatively run capitalist organisation is still going to have an owner and is going to have some kind of property right, mm. individual property right written into it, whereas a cooperative is collectively owned um, and can't be co-opted by an individual for profit motive, which I think is the other elephant in the room, whether or not that is yeah a member should be the difference shouldn't they member active you know membership should be the key difference uh, yes and the definition of a co-op is a voluntary association of people where the members are own and democratic well collectively own and democratically control the organization and if you were really strict about that ICA definition and you look at some of the things we call co-ops, you'd be going, doesn't fit. And it's surprising, even some worker co-ops I know. So I could tell you about a big worker co-op where there's a, a core of controlling members who have been around a long time and then a, a, a circle around them of medium term members and then a, a and then outside of them, a periphery of newer members. And if you hang around for 20 years, you get into the core. 
but the people in the core run the business and in fact earn more than the people at the periphery so you know is that a co-op that's a very interesting yeah is that a co-op <laughs> And do things, you know, are things sometimes co-ops and then they cease to be co-ops and then they come back to being co-ops at some other stage in their existence. And yeah, anyway. Yeah. I think that's your next webinar right there. So <laughs> <laughs> what's a co-op? <laughs> You're on. I'm, I'm so sorry. We've probably got about 30 seconds to wrap up, Bob. Yeah, um, sure. if you wanted to. Um, over to you. Okay, let's just say goodbye then. And thanks very much for talking to us and being here. And, yeah, really uh, appreciate everyone's participation. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks very much indeed, Bob.